Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm talking with Kevin Aho. Kevin is a professor and chair of the College of Arts and Sciences at Florida Gulf Coast University. He has a bachelor's, and a master's, and PhD, all in philosophy from different universities. And many of his focus areas are on existentialism, which is what we talk about in the conversation. Also focuses on phenomenology and hermeneutics and he has taught many courses in these areas and has written uh, many books on uh, existentialism and uh, the book we discuss in, mostly in the conversation is entitled one beat more existentialism and the gift of mortality it's a fantastic book highly accessible um, and so we we discuss that we uh, start the conversation by talking a little bit about his background and then his heart attack that he had, uh, which led him to writing uh, the book. Uh, so we talk about, about that, and he talks about that in the book. We talk about the inevitability of death and what that means for us as humans. We define existentialism and some of the three major concepts there. We talk about some of the critiques of authenticity as some sort of kind of romanticized idea and some of the other contours of human nature. We talk about the herd, the public, the they, and why we avoid the stillness and the negative impact of social media and the digital age. We talk about some of the ideas on disorders and neuroscience. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, we, we definitely disagreed here a little bit. Uh, I think mostly that's just our training and our backgrounds. Um, and so, but it was nice. It was a really nice exchange because, you know, neither one of us tried to shut each other down or anything like that. It was like, oh, this is how I see it. Oh, this is kind of how I see it. And you know, based on my background or my experience, you know, this makes sense. And it was really nice to, to have a, a fun exchange. You know, sometimes I, I don't like <laughs> agreeing, uh, with, with guests too much or, or just, uh, kind of getting information or things like that. So it's always nice to kind of have a, a back and forth and, and, you know, kind of pick at something and, and see what we can come, you know, get out of it. And so that's always a lot of fun. And that was a fun part of the conversation. And then we end it by talking about Nietzsche's ideas of suffering. Well, um, this was such a fun conversation and it was very conversational in tone. And it was nice because, you know, we, you know, we talk about existentialism, which is something I've talked about, uh, you know, a handful of times, uh, on the podcast, but you know, it was, it was very applied and tangible and, um, you know, less on the, the jargon and some of the philosophical, you know, concepts and more of, okay, here's what they are. And then here's how we understand them. And, uh, Kevin's great at that stuff and, and, uh, just a really rewarding and enriching conversation. So now I bring you Kevin. Oh. I am here with Kevin Aho. Kevin, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm really looking forward to, to talking with you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. So you've written a handful of books, but the one that I've read, and I think it's a more recent one, is uh, called One Beat More, Existentialism and the Gift of Mortality. It's a, it's a very uplifting uh, <laughs> title. <laughs> um, so yeah, just tell uh, listeners uh, who you are, what you do, what your background's in, what you, you know, teach, study, and uh, some, of the, some of the things that you've written about. So, uh, so again, I'm Kevin Aho. I'm a, a professor of philosophy in Southwest Florida uh, at a university called Florida Gulf Coast University, which is a part of the state university system in Florida. And um, I live in Fort Myers, which has just been absolutely devastated by Hurricane Ian. Mm. So the university just opened up today, uh, back up to students. Oh. And um, yeah, I've been a, a philosopher here for 17 years is my first job out of graduate school. Uh, and my area of interest has, has from the beginning, from college and even high school, has always been existentialism and, and the questions of what it means to be human, um, the moods of human existence, the ultimate questions, what's the meaning of it all, who am I? These are questions that have always kind of haunted me and inspired me. Um, I was always kind of a neurotic, uh, anxious kid growing up. And so my antenna were always drawn to other writers that have kind of 
darker neurotic uh, tendencies. So uh, Dostoevsky loomed large when I was growing up. Kafka loomed large. Um, um, Rainer Maria Wilke did as well. And of course, the existentialists. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the major existentialists move me in different ways. Uh, and so I started reading uh, philosophy carefully uh, as a late teenager and, and then in college. And, um, but just because I fell in love with existentialism does not mean I fell in love with philosophy. I found philosophy in its kind of mainstream uh, Anglophone incarnation quite boring and uninteresting. Mm. Uh, uh, some of the questions I found uh, provocative. Um, some aspects of epistemology and metaphysics, uh, certain questions in ethics, especially bioethics. But I found the, um, the analyses uh, too abstract and arid for me. And so when I started uh, uh, philosophy seriously in grad school, I wanted to find schools that really focused on um, existentialism and phenomenology. Mm. And uh, I was, uh, my, my career in graduate school was very convoluted and uh, accompanied by numerous disasters and breakdowns. I, I started out after college at uh, a place called the New School for Social Research in New York City. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'd gone there to study uh, with a, a, a very uh, uh, influential Heidegger scholar named Rainer Sherman. But sadly, right uh, after, right before I moved there, he had passed away. And there was a large kind of, uh, there was a big crisis in the university and in the philosophy department at that time, who was going to fill his shoes. Uh, after, I, after a year, I left uh, the new school and, and transferred to the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, which is a very analytic uh, mm -hmm. a program, and I didn't find it very helpful. And after I did my master's degree, I transferred to a third graduate school uh, in Tampa, Florida, the University of South Florida, where I happened to um, uh, work with Charles Guillon, who was a, a very leading uh, and influential Heidegger scholar at the time. And he uh, really played a pivotal role in my intellectual life and philosophical development. And also became my closest and dearest friend for the last uh, 20 years. He sadly passed away during COVID uh, mm. uh, two summers ago. Mm. Um, but working closely with him really kind of uh shaped my my uh understanding of the core ideas of existentialism especially heidegger kierkegaard and nietzsche uh, and then i did a lot of my own uh, uh reading of french uh, existentialism uh independently and um this was my first job out of graduate school this job at florida gulf coast university and uh, most of my teaching revolves around existentially themed courses. So I teach a class called uh, Philosophy of Death and Dying. I teach, of course, existentialism. I teach a class called Existential Medicine. Mm. Um, and I established a, a medical humanities uh, minor here at FGCU, which kind of applies some of the central ideas or key ideas in existentialism and phenomenology to questions of health and illness. Mm. And you see some of that uh, kind of borne out in this book, uh, One Beat More. Uh, what happened is about five years ago, um, I was uh, on a 60 mile bike ride, something that I would do regularly on weekends. I was always kind of uh, athletic and prided myself. It's, it's on a my very long career. bike ride. 60, uh, 60 yes, miles is right. nothing to, nothing to sneeze at. Not, that's, that's pretty, not pretty normal. long. And unfortunately, I was riding alone that day. Sometimes I would ride in a group and I had a massive heart attack. Mm. And uh, the heart attack was followed by a series of serious complications, including uh, tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, tachycardia, and then a, a, a blood clot in my femoral artery. Oof. And I almost died three different times over the course of. I was going to say the, the heart attack alone is is a lot, but then having all of those other subsequent complications is also uh, that's just quite the it's quite the insult to your body there. Yeah, it was insult is the right word. It was it was a real trauma. My world was shattered, and, um, and you were quite young when this happened. It's not like you're yeah, eight years 40, old. Yeah, forty seven years old, forty eight. Uh, gosh, I should know forty eight years old. <laughs> yeah, and. Um, 
I, you know, I thought of myself as someone who was physically fit, but I never really watched my diet. Uh, I probably drank a little too much, uh, ate a lot of fast food. And so I was kind of a ticking time bomb waiting to happen. Mm. But um, needless to say, that event in my life, although traumatizing and kind of world shattering, uh, forced me to confront a lot of the core ideas in existentialism that I understood intellectually and theoretically, but never had to live through. Mm, mm. And of course, the key uh, given uh, that the existentialists explore is death, mm. right? The human beings are finite temporal beings, and death is always right around the corner. It's, our, it's what Kierkegaard calls our most uh, uncertain certainty. Mm -hmm. We know we're going to die, mm -hmm. but we don't know when we're going to die. And it started uh, forced me to kind of think about existentialism less as this kind of dark, brooding, navel-gazing um, exercise, and more as a, a life-affirming exercise, that existentialism forces us to think about what really matters in life. It shakes us into a sense of awakening regarding um, our limited time, that this isn't a dress rehearsal, that, that uh, the moments that we have are precious. And part of the wisdom that came in the wake of the heart attack was going through cardiac rehab with a lot of older folks. Uh, mm. I was probably 20 years older than anyone else in cardiac rehab. And after our exercise, uh, I would sit and talk with them about their lives. And I was always struck that these elders seemed far less shaken and anxious and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. filled with dread than I was. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe there's something that happens as we grow older that we become more understanding and accepting of the, uh, the human condition and the givens that frighten us when we're young and healthy. And that led to the writing of this book, One Beat More. It was kind of a therapeutic exercise to get clear about the lessons that I've learned in the wake of the heart attack. And it's not really a, a, a book about death. It's a book about death awareness and mm -hmm. how death awareness can intensify and enliven existence mm -hmm. uh, by, by reminding us of what's really important. Yeah, that's it's, it's I, I, well, the, the book reads that way. And, and I do feel that it's important to, uh, you know, to live well and to die well, right? And obviously, we don't know. We all have that kind of, um, you know, we're, we're we're always racing towards death in one way, um, and we don't know when it will happen. We like to think it would happen when we're, you know, the age of you know the queen that just passed, you know, yeah. ninety six years old or, or whatever, and you know she died of old age and you know <laughs> whatever it was. But the sad reality is, is that, you know, for many people, that won't be the case. <clears throat> um, and there is obviously that kind of uh, anxiety that, you know, Kierkegaard and, and, and Heidegger both talked about in different ways. Um, and so I guess the, the question I have here is, is you, you're talking about this idea of how you know you 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 knew all the stuff right you knew all the 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 books and the and the philosophy and the ideas and the concepts taught it written about it but i guess what is it about existentialism in particular that can uh can be very helpful in in wrestling with you know the the art of dying i guess yeah it's i i think um this isn't really unique to existentialism. You find this also in, in uh, philosophies of antiquity. You see this mm. in stoicism so, and yeah, yeah. philosophy. You also see it in different uh, wisdom traditions. You see it in Buddhism and, and aspects of Hinduism. Sure. You also see it in, in, in Christian mysticism. Mm -hmm. The idea that um, to live well is to really learn and prepare yourself for death. And key to that preparation is to, is to not deny our temporality, not deny our finitude, but to turn towards it and integrate death and death anxiety into our lives instead of spending most of our lives running away from death, running away from uncertainty, running away from anxiety. We're trying to control it and subdue it with uh, different kinds of immortality projects. 
turn towards death and try to accept it as the other side of life. And um, I think the key to learning how to die well is not to be clinging to life until we die. Part of what I think maturing and, and becoming wise involves is recognizing that central to the human situation is nothingness, that we are no stable thing ever. There's no sense that we are uh, enduring or substantial. We're a, we're a self-fashioning way of being. And um, what that means is that at bottom, we're really no thing at all. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can bring that sense of nothingness or emptiness, uh, in, in one chapter I call it stillness, into our mm -hmm. lives, um, the more we can appreciate the life that we have and the time that we have left. And I think what happens in, in youth and middle age is that we spend so much of our time busying ourselves with life. And oftentimes that busyness is, is consumed with trivial affairs, you know, politics and sports and gossip and travel, that we forget the big questions, the questions of uh, death, freedom, uh, a meaningful life, uh, the richness of human relationships, issues of love and care for others. And we're kind of caught up in our own ego-driven needs and concerns. And when we have moments of real crisis in our lives, uh, a serious illness, a debilitating illness, the loss of a loved one, or as we grow older and move closer and closer to death, those experiences can kind of uh, wake us up mm. and, and shake us into an awareness of what really matters. Mm. Well, I mean, the, the counter to this is, well, so look, Kevin, I mean, if, if I don't believe in an afterlife or a pretty terrible afterlife, I wouldn't want to die. I mean, what I know here yeah. is great. If, if yeah. I'm going, if I'm going to hell or to Sheol or whatever other, you know, some type of purgatory, that's not so good. And, yeah. and if, and if, you know, you listen to, you know, the atheists like me, it's like, well, when you die, you die. And that's it. It's all she wrote. You get one shot. And as far mm -hmm. as we know, you know, that's it. And it's like, well, I don't want to not be here. I don't want to not do this anymore. Now, granted, there are some folks, you know, clinically that, that do wish that, you know, for various reasons. And, and they're really struggling with many uh you know, serious issues of depression and suicidality and sadness. But for the most part, most people are clinging on to life. If we only get, you know, maybe, maybe 60, 65 years of really good quality of life. Um, and we get 80 plus maybe of being on the planet. I mean, that's, I mean, not even a, an eye blink on the, the, yeah. the, the big time clock for the universe. So yikes. I mean, yeah, how, a, how, how do we handle that? Well, it's a good question. I mean, of course, your atheism is reflected in most existentialist positions as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, there yeah. are theistic existentialists like Martin Buber and Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and, and, and other kind of key figures. But most of the key players, and I think I would include Kierkegaard here, even though he's a, a, a religious existentialist in some ways, mm -hmm. You know, Heidegger, Nietzsche, Sartre, Beauvoir, these are all atheistic philosophers. But the, the existentialists would come back to you and say, so you want to live forever? Do you want to live forever? And if so, what is going to give that life its urgency if you live forever? Mm -hmm. There's no, why do anything? Where, how, do you, how are you going to escape boredom? And so there is a there is a, a kind of counter argument to this that was kind of uh, spearheaded by a, a great uh, philosopher Bernard Williams who kind of mm -hmm. referred to himself as an immortality curmudgeon, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he basically argued that that an eternal life or a life that's kind of been technologically or medically extended indefinitely would become tremendously uninteresting and stripped of intensity and passion because death as our temporal limit would go away. And so what death does, and this is what the existentials do so well in reminding us of, mm -hmm. is it reminds us that there's something at stake in life, that there's an urgency that this life can't be taken for granted. This conversation that we're having right now can't be taken for granted. We may not, may not be able to have it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so that, this is what 
what uh, Kierkegaard means by earnestness, that you have to live with a sense of seriousness about life. Mm. If you live forever, what it's just, it's just an amusement. You know, I'm going to travel here. I'm going to travel there. I'm going to fly on a, uh, a, a spaceship with Elon Musk and colonize Mars. Um, and so I'm, I'm inclined to think, you know, if I get 80 years, I will be so thankful. Yeah. If I get 85 years, I'll be so thankful. And I'll, I want to hope that when I get to that point, I will be ready to mm. let go of clinging mm. to life. And of course, the, the more we cling to life, the more we cling to this illusion that we have control over our existence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and one, of the, one of the central themes in existentialist philosophy is that that's an illusion. Right, <laughs> you yes. don't have any control over your existence. Your existence, the fact that you exist at all, yes. is, is pure contingency, pure chance. And your existence is going to be snuffed out on the basis of pure chance as well. And so without death as our temporal limit, Life has no passion. It has no mm. joy. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very interesting. It's a, it's a, again, like many of these things, you know, I mean, I, I obviously fully agree with you, but I think for many folks, it can be very hard to shift that perspective for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, two, two, two points are unrelated, but the, the whole thing about Elon Musk and going to Mars and stuff, there was the, <laughs> there was, I read it yesterday or two days ago. Um, is it William Shatner who went yeah. on the, um, on the um uh, with uh it wasn't musk was it it was um it was the blue the deep blue guy um bezos the British guy is bezos right is it jeff, it was jeff that, bezos yeah 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 and uh, I, I, some articles floating around i saw that he said that it was the most it was like he was going to a funeral i mean yeah. it was so it was not this expanse of discovery and and you know setting some kind of new mission forward and no he just he looked out into space and saw emptiness and blackness and nothingness and it was nothing there it was so i mean obviously from what he could see but in that you know you're in a, sh a spaceship you that's your perspective we obviously know that there are you know millions of universes out there and planets and etc but in that moment and that he said it was a terrible experience yeah. Now, again, you know, there's plenty of astronauts that will say the opposite. You know, that's yeah. amazing. You know, you see, you know, just the the, the yeah. There, in fact, it, that's a, such an interesting point. I read yes. that that yeah. account from Shatner. This this sense of overwhelming dread to see right. The, you know, the Earth is just this little planet in a vacuum. That's that's yeah. That's you know, cosmically overwhelming. Um. Well, you're right. Astronauts, many astronauts have come back with a completely different view. That's it's actually called the overview effect. It's this mm -hmm. kind of mystical experience mm -hmm. when when the astronaut looks back on Earth and recognizes how fragile and yeah. precious this yeah. tiny little planet is that sustains life and sustains love and and the possibility for art and creativity mm -hmm. and and also destructiveness and war and all of the things that make existence what it is and it it was transformative i mean mm -hmm. uh one astronaut became a, a minister after mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. uh, because of the the uh, the effect that it had on him so you know, the counterpoint of, of Shatner's anxiety is awe. Awe, right, awful, right, right. and right. awesome are interrelated. And yes, yes. It, it cuts both ways. And there's a sense that modern anxiety has replaced, you know, pre-Socratic awe and mm -hmm. wonder at the fact that we exist at all. And one of the things that the existentialists try to do, this is especially true of Heidegger and Nietzsche, is to exhume that mood of wonder and awe mm -hmm. that that the, the most wondrous thing is that we exist at all for this fleeting little time on this right. this precarious planet and that the, the sun will eventually turn into a red giant and swallow the entire solar system so mm -hmm. the earth itself isn't an, an infinite enduring uh, uh way station mm -hmm. and so um you know shatner's just just giving us a sense of one half of, of a mood that comes from the same source yeah. of, of awe. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. My, my really good friend, uh, Jonah Paquette, he's a psychologist out in California and uh, he's been on very early on in the, in the early days of my podcast. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, we talk often and, you know, he writes on awe and this is like his, his thing. And it's, it's, um, he, he talks about how awe is, is, 
there's different types and it's, you know, it's, it, it can be really essential for the human experience, but that there's also negative things we can, uh, negative aspects of things we can be in all of. Um, so it's, it's not only just this kind of, you know, positive kind of, uh, overlay, although many times it, it, it is seen that way. The, um, one thing here, just because I'm thinking about it and, um, but before we get into some of the finer details of existentialism, one of the things I've thought about a lot, having read, you know, we've we, like like others, we've we've read the same kinds of dudes, right? I'm a big fan of Dostoevsky, obviously Heidegger, Nietzsche, um, Merleau Ponty is a big fan of, and so many of many of these these folks. And um, I would say when I when I've thought about this, you know, I'm less afraid of death. Um, I I. I I mean, of sorts, I mean, because I don't know how it will happen and, you know, I don't want to be in, you know, suffering or pain necessarily. Um, but I, I've thought about this, like, is that what I'm afraid of? And it's like, no, that's, that's not really what I'm afraid of. And eventually at a certain point, you know, you, you'll, you'll succumb to it and you just kind of say, okay, you know, here we are, you know, you can't avoid it. We all know it. You know, living life is this perpetual self-deception of sorts <laughs> or yeah, right. end of our, ex our existence. But um, is time. I feel, I feel like I don't have enough time mm -hmm. and that's why I don't want to go. I don't have enough time to read all the things, to mm -hmm. listen to all the things, to yeah. talk to all the people, to yeah. experience things, to see history unfold, mm -hmm. you know, obviously in my personal life with my family and things like that. And I don't have enough time. And that sense, that temporality aspect is, mm -hmm. is the, is for me, I mean, uh, maybe not for others, but for me is the, the thing that gives me the most angst. That's, that's the thing of it, right? Is, I don't, I always feel like I don't have enough time and not in a sense of like clock time per se of like, I don't know if I have, have enough hours in a day. I mean, some days, yes, but it's more of just in a general sense of time to, to experience all the experiences. Maybe I'll feel differently, you know, when I'm 80, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a very normal response and, and yeah. look, you're a young man. And so you yeah. have, you, you want to still take a big chunk and bite it out of life and, and experience lots of new things. And, and and consume new experiences and so on. Um, the problem is, I think, is if you get distracted by the consuming of experiences and fail to kind of interrogate why are you mm -hmm. mm -hmm. these experiences? Why do we need more, more, and more? Mm -hmm. And is this a uniquely modern manifestation of anxiety? Uh, did did the pre modern farmer have this same kind of acquisitive uh, appetite mm. for new mm. things? Is this mm. something that's unique to us who are kind of immersed in, in Instagram and social media and yeah. um, instantaneous um, uh, travel from one part of the world to the other? Uh, I would say it's more a product of modernity than the human condition. Well, it's a, it's a downside, I think, of modernity and it's a downside of information, right? It if is. I don't know any of this stuff, Mm -hmm. Right. You know, for the, for, for thousands of years, you know, humans lived in one place in Africa and et cetera. And they didn't know any better. Right. Until, you know, one of our you know, ancestors got up and walked around and said, Oh, we can go to other places. The world's a big place. I mean, there's just, um, yeah, we know too much now. It's like, Oh, there's so yeah. many things. And it's not to have all the experiences per se. I think it's, there's something about curating it in a certain way for certain thing, qualitative things. But, I would imagine that many people feel, you know, I, you know, I want to, you know, see my kids grow up and they get married and all the big life events and so th stuff like that with family. Others may say things like, you know, having, you know, certain experiences. But the interesting thing is, is that there's a freedom and an openness and at the same time an anxiety of we may we will not be able to do all the things so then the becomes what's the choice that we make you know quote unquote choice of what we do decide to invest in or what we do decide to qualitatively put our time and effort into and i think that's you know i see that with a big you know openness but a lot of people see that with a lot of anxiety it's like what if i choose the wrong thing oh my goodness and it's like well that doesn't really exist there's no wrong thing you or right thing you could you know you yeah. pick whichever <laughs> And I think you're you're really keying in on on kind of a, a really a key idea in existentialist philosophy, and that is 
sure, we want more time to, to see things and watch uh, people that we care about grow and flourish. But because we don't have that time guaranteed, we can't take it for granted yeah. that that conversation, that relationship, that yeah. project is something that I can put off until tomorrow. So um, tell your family that you love them. Tell right. your partner that you care about them. Be nice and kind to other people because um, you may not get it tomorrow. Yeah. So uh, the anxiety is an opportunity mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for growth and transformation to live a different life so that you don't you know, take the next summer vacation for granted or yeah. the visit to my grandparents' house for granted. You may not mm -hmm. see them again. Yeah. And, yeah. and so that recognition of, of life's frailty and, and precarity, um, again, jolts us into that awareness. And mm -hmm. so and this is why anxiety is viewed by folks like Kierkegaard and Heidegger as a teacher. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. an edifying experience. It's not something to be sedated or uh, something that we should turn away from or recoil from. It's something we should learn from because it's telling us that, you know, um, this is the only game there is and you you you've got to you've got to take it very seriously yeah no i i i fully agree and i think it is a kind of a privilege and a gift of sorts to to treat that to, with care uh to try and, and to manage that kind of uh, potential opportunity i want to talk about i guess just generally i mean we've been talking about it and and maybe some people will have some you know general understanding of it but you, you listen a book the the three principles of existentialism you know the existence yeah. before essence uh capacity to feel and authenticity maybe just tell us what is existentialism and you you know how do you usually describe it you can go as you yeah. know in depth as you want and uh some of these these uh three subcategories to explain it well, you know, the word existentialism really doesn't refer to anything because the ism doesn't refer to a unified school or doctrine mm -hmm. in the way that, say, maybe empiricism or rationalism does uh, or, or pragmatism, some other kinds of isms. And the word wasn't coined until 1944. So uh, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche couldn't have been existentialists because the word existentialism didn't exist. It was coined by... Uh, Gabriel Marcel uh, uh, as a reference to the philosophy, the, the work and writings of Jean-Paul Sartre and, and Simone de Beauvoir, who, when they were labeled as existentialists, they rejected the label. Like, we're not yeah. existentialists. We're philosophers who write about existence. Mm -hmm. And so maybe um, philosophers of existence is a better word than existentialism mm -hmm. because the, the suffix, the ism, um, is a bit misleading. Mm -hmm. So the first principle generally uh, of existentialism is this pithy phrase that Sartre introduces in mm -hmm. um, a lecture that he gave in 1945 called Existentialism as a Humanism that was yeah. later published as a short little pamphlet. It's great. It's, it's very nice. It's a nice kind of go-to. Uh, yeah, so it's, the, it's the gold standard. Yeah. But he steals the line from Heidegger's Being in Time. This is on the first page of the first division of Being in Time. Right. The essence of Dasein lies in its existence. So he's mm -hmm. stealing from Heidegger. And of course, Heidegger steals from Kierkegaard. Mm -hmm. He says human existence is a, is a way, as a process of becoming. It's not a being. It's a way of being. And so the, the, the phrase existence precedes essence literally means there is no pre-given nature or essence that determines human beings. Mm. We make our essence through our own meaning-giving choices and actions. And this is why we are distinct from all other things, all, all other organisms, all other objects, because we are self-making. We give meaning to our existence. And so uh, what that means is, when a human being says, that's just the way I am, I've always been like that, they're denying the fact that existence is always a process of making yourself who you are. You can't blame your, your upbringing, you can't blame your genetics or biology or socioeconomic circumstances, because you can always take a stand on those uh, facts about mm -hmm. who you are, interpret them, and give them meaning. So there's nothing fixed and static about human existence. We're, we are uh, 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 self-fashioning or self-making beings. 
our essence comes from our actions and choices. So uh, Sartre uses this example in, uh, in his writings. He says, the, the coward doesn't, isn't born a coward. The coward makes himself a coward by committing cowardly acts. Mm -hmm. Right. You can't blame your biology or your, your neurotic tendencies or your abusive upbringing for your cowardice. Your, cow your, your cowardice is a choice of actions and, and decisions that you've made. And uh, what it does is it is it is an effort by the existentialists to separate or distinguish human existence from all other forms of existence. Mm. All other forms of existence are determined by their tactical limitations. Like my, my cat is determined by its instincts. My cat is not taking a stand on its existence <laughs> and wondering what it will be in the future. Mm -hmm. But human beings do because we fashion ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's the first principle. Existence precedes essence. The second key principle of existentialism is the idea that the awareness of the human condition is not really brought to us through detached reflection. It's not a process of, of reasoning or logical argumentation. The issues of human existence come to us through moods. We become aware of the human condition through deep and penetrating emotional experiences. And this is why, for the existentialists, different moods serve different kinds of functions. So, you know, for Kierkegaard and Heidegger, it's anxiety and guilt. For mm -hmm. Jean Paul Sartre, it's nausea. For, mm -hmm. for Nietzsche, it's horror. Mm -hmm. Or Camus, it's absurdity, mm -hmm. and 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 these philosophers use these words, uh, the, these these terms to describe moods that um, disclose the human condition in certain ways, and all of those you know those words absurdity, nausea, anxiety, guilt disclose the fact that existence is fundamentally unsettled, mm -hmm. um, that we are no thing, literally. There's nothing that undergirds, stabilizes, or secures our existence. We exist, but we don't have to exist. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for us to exist. And mm -hmm. those, those powerful emotional experiences teach us that. Mm -hmm. They remind us of this. So mm -hmm. for the existentialists, it's emotions more than reason that serve as instructive uh, features of our, of our condition, which is very different from the Western philosophical tradition, which always privileges yeah. theoretical reflection and detached reasoning. And then the final feature is the one that's probably the most controversial, that existentialists are really not concerned with goodness <laughs> or doing what is right. Mm -hmm. They're not so much concerned with those kinds of normative questions about right conduct or distinguishing between good and evil acts. Those are important, yeah. but they're not, they're always subservient or ancillary to the deeper, more primordial question of being true to yourself. Mm. The most important thing in life is not to do good. The most important thing is to be true to who you are. Mm. And oftentimes when we're authentic or true to who we are, that means we sometimes have to suspend our obligations to moral principles. We have to, this is what Kierkegaard calls the teleological suspension of the ethical in, uh, in, in his book called Fear and Trembling. And it's what Nietzsche means when he says we need to go beyond good and evil. Mm -hmm. We can't let, uh, because good and evil are just social constructs. They're, they're human inventions. We invent these categories of good and evil. And then, as Nietzsche says, we forget that we invented them and call them true. Mm -hmm. And so... The, the core aim of, of a good life or an, a praiseworthy life for the existentialists is one, when, is one where we're authentic or true to who we are and are honest about the givens of the human condition. And those givens are death or temporality, the fact that we're free to create ourselves, the fact that life is fundamentally meaningless in any enduring or overarching sense. It doesn't mean that it has no meaning. It means that the only meaning it has is what you give it, mm. the, the meanings that you give it through your own choices and actions. And then the last given is generally understood as loneliness, that we're all alone in the world. No one else can know what we're really going through. I can't feel my way under your skin and get a sense of what Xavier is all about. Yeah. And so, you know, so, so death, freedom, meaninglessness, and, and, and loneliness are central 
uh, conditions that we need to kind of accept and own up to. I think it's interesting about the authenticity piece. I mean, I, I agree, but some of the counters to this is that, you know, well, what, what, what authentic self, what, yeah, which, I, which, which self, and yeah. that some people will say that this is a romanticized notion of the self, right? That it's this idea of just be your true self, whatever that is, um, but that it doesn't, um, it doesn't take into account of, well, really your authentic self it could be i mean we we're, we're you know creatures or animals like anyone else and human nature is really fucked up i mean yeah. we can do some horrible things so you want to be authentic to that that's yeah. what you want to be authentic to the person yeah. that can you know say the worst things and can go and, and murder and rape and all these horrible things you know those are part of human nature those are the things we don't want to do those are the things that we we as a society say eh, that's not good for us we're going to kill each other and you know yeah. cause harm um and so in that way critics of authenticity will say like well you can't have it both ways here you can't just say well authentic to some parts of yourself authenticity is this kind of aspect of authentic of of yourself and so in that way people will claim this this kind of romanticized idea and and, and i guess my, to my uh i mean i don't fully agree with the argument but uh, what, what are your thoughts on some of these kind of counters well, I mean, a couple of things first the existentialists were deeply influenced by romanticism and uh -huh. uh, german romanticism french romanticism uh, even British Romanticism. So, so you know, Romanticism is is generally a backlash against uh, an overly scientific and rationalized and automated way of being that was beginning to take shape in the age of reason, as as the the dawn of modernity was beginning to uh, emerge. And so, you know, figures like uh, Rousseau and, and Baudelaire and Rimbaud and Wordsworth and Coleridge, all of these figures were kind of reactionary to that kind of arid, desiccated and dehumanizing mm -hmm. aspect of, of the age of reason and modernization. So, you know, Nietzsche and Heidegger uh, uh, were deeply influenced by, by German romanticism. Yeah. But um, the issue of the dark or primal and violent urges of the human condition is something that the existentialists want to bring to the surface and, and mm -hmm. force us to recognize and own up to. And you'll see that in, in a lot of the, the, the kind of key texts in existentialist literature, the protagonists are murderers, right? Yeah. Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment, mm -hmm. Marceau and, and Camus the Stranger, mm -hmm. uh, the vicious trio of Estelle, Garçon, and, and um, uh, Arnaud, I can't remember the third character, in Jean-Paul Sartre's No Exit. They're all murderers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so um, they're very mindful of these dark qualities of the human condition, but there is an ethics in existentialism. Mm -hmm. And the ethics is, you know, human being, you can commit acts of violence and cruelty and destruction, but you can't blame anyone for those acts but yourself. Mm -hmm. You made that choice. Mm -hmm. And if you are the product of your choices, then you're a murderer and a killer and a cruel human being. Mm -hmm. So part of what it means to recognize or own up to ourselves as free, self-creating individuals is that we have to take responsibility for the acts that we commit or mm -hmm. undertake. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, we're not being true to ourselves. We're living in a state of self-deception. So authenticity uh, can, can, can kind of fold itself into a kind of ethics mm -hmm. where we recognize that, yeah, you can do violent things. You can commit acts of, of, of atrocity. But you did that. You can't blame your parents. You can't blame your faulty biochemistry. You can't blame Donald Trump. You're the one that did it. Mm -hmm. And so um, by, by kind of promoting the idea of freedom and self-fashioning as central to the human condition, they're also burdening the individual with personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. that you're not a slave to your impulses. You're not a slave to your drives. That's what animals are. Animals can't help but do these things because they're trapped in their instincts. But what distinguishes us from animals is that we have the capacity to rise above or transcend those instincts by reflecting on them, considering what those instincts will what, what those acts will result in down the line, how they will shape my identity and self-interpretation. 
So we're not at the mercy of those dark compulsions. We have to be aware that they're there, but we don't have to act on them. Yeah, I, I would, I would, I fully agree with you. I mean, in in some ways, some people would say, "Well, this is a, this is an artificial human. We want to be something we're not." Where you know, which I I don't agree with the framing per se, but I understand the the I think the subtext. But the idea is, I would say it this way: to me, the human the human spirit, uh, human human nature is, it, well, it is right i don't i don't want to put any value judgment on it it is and 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 there are some things that can be done if we're talking about actions or behaviors that can be you know by any definition some of the most horrible things we can do to another person to another organism to the planet etc that's a fact but we can also do the same from the same uh you know uh, person can do some of the most wonderful uh, loving, benevolent acts, right? We, we, you know, so we, the same person has the capacity to do all of them. And for me, I think you have to have an acceptance of that. And you, when you, you have an, an awareness, yes, but an acceptance of that. And, and I don't think, you know, people can make moral or value judgments on, on those things. Um, but, but what was it that Nietzsche said that, you know, with, with, with morals, what you're really asking for is you're just, you're just asking about intentions. That's all you really care about, right? The morals are kind of a, kind of a facade of sorts, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting, but really you're asking about the intentions of someone, which is really hard to understand. Yeah. It, it, it's, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, please. Well, I think you're absolutely right. And, and of, of course, I think of all the existentialists, Nietzsche really keys in on this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, he wants to get rid of this kind of facile dualism between good and evil, that mm -hmm. existence is both good and evil. Um, yeah. Human beings are good and evil. We can, just like you say, commit acts of tremendous tenderness and love, and at the same time, to, to people we care about, and at the same time be cruel and vicious to the people we care about. That's right. Yeah. And, um, and, this is a theme that comes up later in French existentialism, where the conception of ambiguity becomes so central mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. defining feature of the human condition that human human existence is ambiguous. It's not good or evil. It's both and. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so we need to again go beyond those simple binaries uh, of good and evil and recognize that. Um, there are no real heroes out there. We're all human, all too human. And I mean, think about the great philosophers that we're talking about. Heidegger was a vicious Nazi and anti-Semite. Oh, yeah. Dostoevsky was an anti-Semite. Uh, Nietzsche says horrible misogynist things oh, in yeah. his work. Oh, yeah. Sartre was a was a, 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 a womanizer, sexual predator <laughs> yeah, in the yes. worst kind of way. Yes, yes. Uh, and so these are all people who were brilliant and 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 offer deep and rich insights into the human condition and how to live a, a, a meaningful and fulfilling fulfilling life. But we're at the same time loathsome human beings. That's right. And yeah. uh, and and that's no reason to not read them. It's it's mm -hmm. a reason to read them because they remind us of our own ambiguity. And well, so, and, and, yeah. well, and it's and it's that, and it's that every single human being has a, objective and or subjective aspects of them that people would find reprehensible. Right. Exactly. I think that I don't think there's a certain when people make condemnations about. Now, again, we can con, you know uh, not condone the 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 uh, bad actions or or many of the the patterns that they have. I mean, we we shouldn't we shouldn't do that. Where we shouldn't say, "Oh, it's fine," or they get a pass. You know, but at the same time, there's an arrogance there for people condemning people that are doing horrible things as if to say, well, I don't do anything or there's a, there's a, a level to it, which I think there is importance with a hierarchy of things. There are some things that are really terrible that should be adjudicated in a modern society, et cetera. But the, 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 the major principle of this is you become very arrogant if you say, well, I wouldn't do anything like that, yeah. or that's not, you know, I, I, sometimes there's this fun uh, I, thought experiment that, you know, I'll have with people. I'll say, you know, would you ever kill someone? And most people react to, oh, no, I would never do that. <laughs> no, no, I'd never do that. And I say, you haven't thought about this question too long or very hard. Because uh, then, the, then they turn, would you? Would you kill someone? It depends. And they say, well, 
it depends on the situation and you know and 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 that's why we have in our legal system this whole thing of you know first degree second degree premeditated etc but i mean it's not hard to fathom you know crimes of passion whatever it may be you know if somebody does something to to my loved ones you know tortures them or abducts them or whatever you know you could say it's justified or it's not justified okay that's fine but the fact is I'm, I, I'm going to be pushed to a place that I don't entertain on a daily or weekly or monthly or yearly basis. Yeah. But I know that there's somewhere in the corners of my humanity that that's there mm -hmm. right now. I'm not thinking about it. I'm not dwelling about it. I'm not, but I'm aware of that and I accept that. And then I would make that decision in that moment. Now, I don't know what I would do in that moment, right? Depends on the circumstance, all these things. But there's an arrogance of sorts where people, oh, I would never do this. Oh, that's a, that's a horrible thing. Or where the, worse, where they're judging and condemning or and or canceling people for various indiscretions. Mm -hmm. It's like you're saying that you're somewhat better or that you're not going to do this. Or, And again, we can condemn and people need to be uh, 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 you know, rightfully uh, serve the consequences of certain actions, etc., and and then and then that's it you know it yeah. doesn't mean they cease being a human and it's much less when you're on the hot seat you would want you know again things to be appropriately doled out but then also what does that mean in the afterward and so i, I think some people maybe because it makes them some of the ambiguity or makes them uncomfortable they they can't sit with that because it's too unsettling for them the potential yeah, it's, of that. It's a great point and you know existentialists especially figures like Nietzsche and Dostoevsky are wonderful at exposing those hypocrisies yeah, of yeah. how we want to break the world up into these simple uh, binaries, binaries yeah. yeah there's a great yeah. line in, in uh Dostoevsky's the brothers Karamazov where he says mm -hmm. um I think it's Ivan Karamazov is having a conversation with Alyosha yeah. and Ivan says Inside of every human being is an axe murderer. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's a great line. It just depends on the circumstances. That's right. And uh, and that doesn't mean the person that murders his actions is necessarily bad. Yeah. You see, and and so you know, part of the the the, the great insight of Dostoevsky's literature is that he humanizes the, these people that are so vicious on uh, socially vicious and cruel and prisoners and drunkards and 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 thieves and murderers that have been in prison and now they're back in, in, in the public world. And he shows them in all of their humanity that these are, these are people that also have capacities for tremendous love and tenderness. And um, for Dostoevsky, it was really his time as a prisoner in Siberia yeah. that he kind of woke up to this, this, yeah. uh, this aspect of the human condition. He wrote about it in memoirs from the House of the Dead. Mm -hmm. And 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 spent much most of the his later writings his his major characters were kind of loathsome human beings that had qualities of redemption in them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, and you see this in Rask most famously probably in Raskolnikov in the, mm -hmm. in the uh, narrative arc in Crime and Punishment I mean the only major character in Dostoevsky's corpus that has no redemptive qualities is is the underground man yeah. Yeah. Um, who is just this kind of loathsome, vile creature throughout. But um, evidently, um, Dostoevsky had a chapter that was taken out by editors. Um, and in that, right before the penultimate chapter of, of Notes from the Underground, where it was all about the redemptive character of Christ and how every mm -hmm. human being needs to be redeemed. But the editors didn't want to include it because it took away uh, from the force of the, of the mm -hmm. short story. And so, um, notes from the underground would have been very different if that mm. chapter had been included. But yeah, yeah I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, again, it just I, the more and more, especially as I get older, I just see the, you know, the the in terms of human nature. I mean, again, I'd be clear: we we should condemn actions and behaviors that are inappropriate or, or what society or certain societies may say is wrong I, i'm not saying that you know that we should we people do some horrible things and that should be punished of sorts of, of course but in terms of the human experience and human nature these are still people right even if you think of the worst of the worst so to speak right so still humans right 
and they have thoughts, feelings, instincts, intuitions. And we have to have, if you care about human rights, if you care about humanity, if you care about those things, you don't get to just have your spotlight effect of empathy. That that's yeah. that's a that's a kind of that's a kind of universal of sorts. And so that's I think really where you can see again, that doesn't mean that everybody needs to think about this, but I think we should be somewhat more humble in, in how we how we, we treat folks. Well, so, you know, and the existentialists are are helpful here because they'll say you don't even have to look outside at 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 your neighbors or read the newspaper or watch CNN. Look at your own life. Look That's at right. the loathsome and vile things that you've done in your own life, the lies, deception, the perverse fantasies, uh, right. the illicit uh, desires, and so on. It's, you know, um, Freud's notion of the id was deeply influenced by Nietzsche. I mean, his mm -hmm. whole notion yep. of the id as this inchoate wellspring of drives and desires that we have no control over and have no understanding of. You know, Nietzsche calls that the Dionysian. It's this these kind of thonic urges and energies that make us who we are yeah. and they're terrifying. Yeah. And we spend most of our lives trying to control and subdue them uh, instead of finding ways to release them creatively through works of art or music or poetry or human mm -hmm. relationships. And Nietzsche would call that, or Freud might call that, creative sublimation. Yeah. Um, right. Instead, we repress them and and refuse them and deny that these are aspects of who we are. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but, yeah, I told I totally agree. I mean, obviously, I'm a, I'm a you know clinically, I'm a big Freudian, so I, mm -hmm. you're, you're preaching to the yeah. choir here. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. all about sublimination, all these things. I mean, yes, yes, of course, <laughs> of course. You know, um, yeah, and I and I and I think that you know this is a rooted in a kind of you know Darwinian evolutionary kind of concept as well. Maybe not as directly, but. Um, you know, we are at the very least, uh, uh, you know, mammals. We, we're in that that kingdom, and you know, we're multicellular organisms, and we have urges and drives. And of course, that's not all we're made up of. And you know, but at, we have to respect it and understand it, and and not put our instincts uh, in this you know box and buried at the bottom of the ocean. We have to say, how do we, how do we have our instincts front and center? but anchored to, you know, uh, a balance of cognition and emotion. Right. And mm -hmm. I think that's Nietzsche's whole, whole argument. Yeah. I, um, I would, I would say there, there's, there's something you mentioned in the book, which I, I, I wanted to ask about, which is really interesting is you say that, you know, Nietzsche had the herd, right. And Kierkegaard mm -hmm. had the public Heidegger yeah. had the, they, yeah. you know, they're all picking up, you know, the same, the same thing, they're reading from the same sheet of music of sorts, although they, yeah. they talk about it in different ways. You know, what are some of the similarities here and, and how do we understand this in the context of, of stillness and how do we understand where we're at in our, our, our world? Yeah. Um, you, you just talk about the the yeah. herd, the herd instinct, and the they, and and it is very interesting concepts. I've always always had a lot of fun yeah, it's, it's, thinking it's about this. It's kind of a character trait of of the existentialist of uh, making kind of pejorative comments about everyday life, what Heidegger calls average everydayness. Right. Uh, it looks like a judgment. It looks like a dismissive comment about conformity, of walking in lockstep with other people. And, um, you know, when Kierkegaard talks about the public, when Nietzsche talks about the herd, when Heidegger talks about the they, they're just talking about the ways in which in our ordinary lives, we are not authoring our own existence. We are, mm -hmm. we are living the life that others want us to live. So um, I, I didn't choose really to go to college. I go to college because that's what one does when they turn 18. Um, so the, the, you know, the German word for the, the, that's translated as the they, das Mann, really is translated as the what, the anyone. It's what anyone else would do. We do yeah. what anyone else does. And um, that's how we live most of our lives. And one of the things that comes out in especially, well, actually all three of these characters, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Heidegger, is that when we are absorbed and caught up in the bustle of herd life, we are in a state of distraction. We're distracted and busy with things that aren't really important in life. And so um, think about the ways in which um, 
being a they self today involves living a tremendous, a, a large portion of our lives online, oh, yeah. surfing Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, I'll get these alerts on my phone that will say things like, you spent five and a half hours this week just looking at Twitter or just looking at Instagram. And it's a, a kind of horrifying thing mm -hmm. to kind of realize how many hours of my life I'll never get back because of this kind mm -hmm. of empty, trivial mm -hmm. uh, gossip gazing that I'm doing on social media. Oh yeah, yeah. So, it's, 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 know, I'm in the same bucket there. I mean, I, oh, yeah. I, I try Absolutely. to reduce. I try to reduce, and 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 there's a lot of good things I think about Twitter, especially. I don't have any other social media, but it is. There's some really positive aspects, but it, there's some really awful, obviously, aspects to it. And it is a thing of like you don't recognize it, and then you're like, oh gosh, that's too many hours. <laughs> it's too many yeah. hours. And and part of it is for for the existentialists is that. In staying busy with the crowd and doing what they do, we never have to run up against the stillness, the nothingness, the emptiness of existence itself. Mm -hmm. And so um, if I said to you, Xavier, what did you do last night? This is actually a Seinfeld episode. <laughs> if I said, Xavier, what did you do last night? You said nothing. I didn't do anything. I did nothing. You never do nothing. You, right, you right. watch TV. You were right. online. You played right. Halo. Um, mm -hmm. You were reading a book. You never do nothing because nothing scares us. Right. Um, and one of the things that comes out in um, the existentialist tradition, less so in Kierkegaard, but you'll see it in, in uh, uh, Nietzsche, you'll see it in Heidegger, and you'll see it in some aspects of religious existentialists as well, and folks like Martin Buber and Gabriel Marcel, is this... Uh, Fear of not being distracted by something. Um, Blaise Pascal, who, who you could call a proto-existentialist, says the thing that we're most afraid of or the thing that we find most difficult is just sitting quietly in a room yeah. without anything to absorb or occupy our time. And because what that does is it brings us face to face with who we are. That's uh, right. That's suddenly right. we start thinking about the human condition. We start mm -hmm. uh, becoming anxious. And, and part of what I wanted to suggest in the book is that the effort to distract ourselves and busy ourselves with conformist life becomes more and more difficult as we become older and more disabled. Mm. We can't handle the accelerated, uh, distracting pace of everyday life anymore, and we have to become more comfortable with stillness. And one of the things that was so horrifying and, and difficult for me when I was in intensive care wasn't the pain, wasn't even the anxiety of the, of the uncertainty of my condition. It was lying still on a hospital bed. Yeah. And it was absolutely unnerving and disorienting. And, and, and part of what is built into the culture of the they self, the culture of busyness, of herd life, is the idea that I'm in control of things. Yeah. I'm controlling things. When I get on Instagram, suddenly I'm in control of the scroll. When I'm on the phone, I'm in control. When I'm shopping, I'm in control. When I'm doing what they do, I have this illusory sense of mastery of my situation. Um, and what stillness does is it reminds us that that is an illusion. It's been an illusion all along. Yeah. And, and can you just sit still? Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I draw on these quotes from Z Nietzsche Zarathustra, where mm where Zarathustra starts to appreciate and, and revel in stillness. And he, he'll kind of associate that with genuine leisure. Mm -hmm. uh, like re real leisure isn't playing golf or going on a cruise or going to Vegas. Real leisure is purposeless play where you're actually not trying to do anything or trying to accomplish anything. You're just sitting uh, and marveling at the fact that you exist at all. And so there's these descriptions in Zarathustra of, of, of the character uh, lying in the meadow and, and he's left the market, the bustling den of the marketplace and he's lying in a meadow. And, and the quote is stillness, stillness. That is the beauty. This is, mm -hmm. this is, this is, this is God, mm -hmm. you know, uh, being still finally. And uh, it's very hard for us in modern technological societies to kind of even get a sense of what that means because we're in a state of hyper arousal all the time. 
Yeah. We're awakened with technological devices. We go to sleep with technological devices. We carry around these information systems with us all day, every day. Um, I get email, text alerts constantly throughout the day. And so when do you have an opportunity to disengage and disconnect from that state of, of, of everyday busyness, everyday uh, acceleration? And um, it's a real question. This is something that Heidegger is so well in his later writings, his later critiques of technology. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have an answer for it. I'm, I'm hoping that as I get older, I'll become more um, facile with letting go of technology and letting go of that need to be in control of things. Um, but, but at this age, at this point in my career, in my life, I am a, I am a junkie. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it, it is, it is very much that way where it becomes that way. I mean, you know, obviously you're, you're, you're old enough to remember, and, and I'm one of the last generations to remember a time before all this technology. I can remember the time before the internet and, you know, computers have been around, but you know, there's a personal home computer. I can remember a time before that as well. And, and, um, I can think back on those memories I have when I was younger and how, um, how do I say it? different is, is correct, but that's not what I'm trying to say. It, it, the world was different, but it was, I don't want to say simpler, uh, cause that seems a little idyllic of sorts. I'm, what I'm trying to say is, is that it was the, the world hadn't changed, like how the world was in 1991 or 92 or 90 or 89 or whatever in the late eighties, nineties was not that different in terms of technology from 1955 yeah, or 1960. Yeah. It was radio, television, newspaper, and that was about mm -hmm. it. You know, mm -hmm. and and again, I'm not I'm not saying we got to go back to a time that way or that this was the golden years. I'm not making a value statement on it. It's just there was less change, and so yeah. from now, so from when you you know early 90s, <clears throat> really to 2000, I think there was a kind of steadiness to it where it was like okay, you know, we have you know different types of computers and people doing different things in different companies and you know dot com era all that, mm -hmm. but it really was. I think Apple was a fantastic uh, innovator and Steve Jobs and everything, but with the iPhone and then I think the iPad was 2010. I think the first one, if I can't remember correctly. And it just exploded. Yeah, it just yeah. exploded, and so we've had, uh, you know, a decade, fifteen years of just this. I mean, there was no. I mean, Facebook was in its very early days when you need a, you needed a college email to get a Facebook or whatever. Yeah, exactly. You know, like no. you know, um, you know, and 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 all you had was you know MySpace and whatever blogs, and that was it. And like. Again, it's just that exploded on the social media piece. So you, when you think about it, and again, I'm, I mean, there, are, there's so much of that that happened too fast. I really believe that. I, I think all of that stuff's great. Uh, there's obviously the negative sides which we're seeing, but it was so fast. It was so fast, and all the access to to information. All it, it's again, we haven't caught up to those things, and it continues to go extremely fast. And you know, this, this is definitely tangential, but this is why I'm not a big proponent of big change really fast, whether it's necessary or not. I'm not a proponent of that because I think we see that in other aspects of our lives. We can have huge structural issues in um, our, our culture and in our society and in our economy, but we should not just change things really fast because we, it's, it's a yeah. shock to the system and it's not I, a good I, thing. I agree. I mean, and I, I have similar feelings about this, this, the abruptness of technological innovation and the miniaturization of, no. of speed and acceleration through iPhones. But imagine these generations now that are born into this, you know, my students, for instance, that have not known a world without smartphones. And they are from a very early age, have immediate access to hardcore pornography and violence, whatever right. they want. Uh, not not finding uh, a Playboy under their dad's bed when they were thirteen, right. but graphic, hardcore violence and porn. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, access to to a, a dark web, to to uh, illicit drugs, guns, uh, different aspects of criminality, and uh, that's the world that they're habituated into. And so, one of the things that that I've done in in uh, applied existentialism, applying existentialism to health and illness, is to talk about 
or explore the notion that, you know, these pathologies like ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, you know, that term didn't even exist until 1980. It was first ADD in the third mm -hmm. edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And then in 1994, they added the hyperactivity disclaimer, mm -hmm. became ADHD. I argue about the possibility or explore the possibility that that's a social construction. It's not as if children are uh, kind of uh, genetically more uh, uh, inattentive now and distractible now. It's that they've been enculturated into a situation that is fundamentally distracting. And they're in a state of hyper arousal 24-7. They're, they're basically being raised by screens. Uh, um, and uh, I, I, I think I probably have adult onset ADHD because I've been so habituated by these devices. And uh, I'll do this thing called media stacking when I'm traveling. I'll have my laptop open, my iPad open, and my smartphone, and the TV will be on. Right here, yes. So I'll have four yes. different screens. I mean, I'll be maneuvering through different levels of information, and it's all empty distraction. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's so much benefit from it. But yes, what I would say two things. The first thing I would say is, is that there is a in terms of like the accessibility to like hardcore porn and all this stuff look i mean <clears throat> i totally agree with you i think what it is 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 it's the same problems and it's the same things we need to for, for parents and for educators and for you know people role models is to still give the same kind of guidance you know how do you train you know uh, children to have good critical thinking to be very invested in their you know emotional experiences how do they you know do pro-social things with other humans how do they have well-being you know there's certain things that we do certain virtues or characteristics that's fine i don't think that changes yeah. um and and the medium does change. The only difference now is the stakes are on like fifteen now, right? Before, like, look, you know, seeing dad's Playboy under the bed was, you know, <laughs> not a good thing at you know a certain age. But it wasn't gonna, you know, it's, it's not like seeing like hardcore like BDSM videos in four K, like you know, at your fingertips. Yeah. So it's just the stakes are higher. I don't think it's wildly different. I do just think the stakes are higher. About mm -hmm. the ADHD thing, I'll just say this. Um, I get what you're saying, and I and I definitely think that the the screen time is not helpful. It's not helpful. Um, I will say, I think, in terms of the existence of it, you know, one of the things about good science is that you know you do good science and you realize things. The '90s was really, especially the early '90s and throughout, was really the decade of the the brain, and mostly because we just had really novel and better ways to take pictures of the brain, and and ADHD, it, which is a neurodevelopmental disorder, much like uh, learning uh, disabilities, autism, Tourette's, stuttering, um, you know, et cetera, intellectual disability. The way that's classified that way is because basically uh, neuroscientists were able to, and, and, and neurologists and psychiatrists were able to say, Okay, we know what these, so the brain's all connected and it does many things, but we know that these regions or these areas of the brain do this stuff. Inhibition, you know, shifting sets, sustained attention, you know, et cetera, right? They're doing these things, right? Subcortical, prefrontal cortex, et cetera. And so what they were seeing once they had some longitudinal studies and they were able to take, you know, some good imaging scans of, of, of folks' brains, they were able to say, we're seeing... These types of folks have a similar part of the brain that has lower than normal levels of white matter in, in tracks or lower le than le normal levels of various neurotransmitters. And when we see that, we see these um, constellation of uh, behaviors and symptoms. Okay, so then you just find the pattern, you find the categorization, okay and then we get adhd so is, is it is it possible or is it likely that people had this for different you know periods of history yeah i i mean probably um you can look back to stuff that's happened um uh you know in in you know at different points in history 
Um, my friend Chris Ferguson wrote a book on this and kind of this history of madness and insanity and the differences and the nuance. And it's like, you know, this person today probably would have had just depression, but they were called insane and put in an asylum in Bedlam or whatever in 18, <laughs> whatever yeah. it was. So now we know some things, right? And, and that's still an evolving, you know, practice. And so, um, you know, I think that that's, it's obviously a, a, it's a real thing. I don't think it's just a matter of a social cultural piece, although I don't think that that's right. It's been helpful for that, but we do see parts. It's, it's basically a, like many labels, it's a shorthand of saying these areas of the brain have a consistent pattern of lower than normal activity and uh, supplied by this assortment of behaviors within this time frame, et cetera, et cetera, or excuse me, symptoms. So we call that this, right? And yeah. there is variance in that, right? So now, you know, with ADHD, it's you get the label, but you have three subtypes, you know, predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive, impulsive, or combined presentation. So, you know, I, I think that there's, and that's going to continue to evolve and change. It doesn't mean that it was uh, wrong I, or I, things like I, that. I, I see what you're saying. I mean, I'm far more skeptical of brain science uh and the advances and developments of, of neuropathology um and, and and brain science is also skeptical of its findings yeah, oh yeah oh yeah um, but it changes all the time and that's what makes it hard it, it is it's hard um i think the question might be you know you, you if, if there are neurological patterns that are being visible uh through scanning uh, instruments where does that come from? Does that come from genetics or does that come from social conditions? Well, well it's usually the answer is both. And it's yeah, hard it, to, it, to parse out it, which is which. Yeah, that's the, that's the hard part. And, you know, I'm just thinking of my students here at the university. Um, mm. Huge portions of my students are on ADHD medications. None of them are getting brain scans or fMRIs to get those diagnoses. Sure. Yeah, sure. The, 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 uh, the psychiatrist or the, the uh, general practitioner is giving out the medications uh, after very short intake examinations. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's no brain scanning going on in psychiatry. You don't get a brain scan when you go to a <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. And there, yeah. are, there are problems with that for sure that yeah. the world of psychiatry is very familiar with and they're, they've yeah. been dealing with. And for sure, I, I mean, there's arguments for it against that. I will just say about what some of the stuff in terms of the brain science piece of it is that I think for a lot of um, pediatric uh, neurologists. And so, so when we're talking about people that are very shortly after they've been born, some of the stuff you can see in utero, obviously you're not doing yeah. brain scans in utero, but shortly after someone's born and they're, and they're seeing some of these things, you know, very early in development before you get to, um, you know, you know, kindergarten, first grade or whatever, you can see the signs of saying, okay. And that's usually where you can't really get a diagnosis beforehand. Cause you want to make sure What's the normal trajectory, normal percentiles of how folks' brains develop and how people develop? And then when you're starting to see problems, that's where you say, okay, let's investigate this. And then over time, longitudinally, you see these certain patterns. Um, that's usually the way the story goes. And so there's there's some aspects of it. But I agree, there are issues. I mean, like any field, there are issues. And I think the thing is, is that, you know, the brain is a is a is a is like a magical labyrinth of of wonders <laughs> it's this we well, understand yeah. some things and then like yeah. you know phrenology was the biggest thing for however many years and they're like oh that's a terrible idea and so now we've done other things i mean just just to to, to give you what you're saying here you know people when when fmris came out mm -hmm. which is the functional magnetic reason resonance, resonance uh, imaging you know it's basically you put someone in a scanner it's very expensive and you know it lights up Right. And everyone, this is the rage in the mid nineties and the late nineties, the rage. Everyone was like, Oh my goodness. This is like, you know, the best thing since, you know, sliced breads, you know, since berries, you know, like studies or whatever. Um, and then we come to find out after doing a bunch of studies, it's like, well, that doesn't tell us anything. <laughs> exactly. It's just yeah. telling us where in the brain it's lighting up, but it doesn't yeah. say what's wrong. It doesn't give us a diagnostic. That's you know, true. And, that's and, my point. Yeah. And they're, they're, that's they're, they're look, fMRIs are, are good. I mean, they're very good supplements. Um, but now we understand that the, all of the brain is connected. So it's just one of those things where we, we keep building and we say, okay, mm -hmm. a little bit here, a little bit here. But yes, and there are many errors. The there was, one a, thing, great, there was oh, yeah. a great article in the New Yorker a couple of years ago about, um, taking fMRIs into prisons and scanning the brains of murderers uh, who exhibited very little capacity for empathy or remorse for their uh, crimes. 
and and then scanning the brains of CEOs at powerful companies <laughs> and seeing that the brain lit up in similar ways right. uh, uh, for these aspects of psychopathy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, a lack of empathy may be helpful to be a captain of industry, and it also may be helpful to be a cold-blooded murderer and killer. Oh, well, so, I mean, again, yeah. this is a, a whole another conversation, but I absolutely agree with that, actually. Yeah, um, it's, it's there, so there are... There are, how do I say this without people misunderstanding me? There are adaptive, mm, there are learned adaptations that people have within society that fall on some traits of psychopathy. And most of the time you see that in politicians, CEOs. Again, psychopathy is not, um, that's also a range, it's also a continuum. Because people have certain traits such as Machiavellianism or you know some type of narcissism, that doesn't mean that it's bad per se. It's it's not a value thing. It's more of a how do you manage that? And sometimes you need certain certain aspects of those traits for certain types of domains. And, you know that stuff makes people obviously really queasy because they just think everyone's Ted Bundy out there. And that, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm not saying all politicians are Ted Bundy out there. Although um, you know maybe, maybe some politicians maybe, 90%. maybe some politicians aren't aren't as uh, aren't as good. So there was a there was a fun paper that came out. Um, oh God, this was probably 10, 15 years ago now, where there was. Um, folks that had done the hair scale and psychopathy and stuff. And they had, they had looked at this, you know, some of the traits with some of our past presidents. I think it was Johnson, Clinton, one of the Bushes, Nixon. Yeah. It was a couple, it was a couple of presidents and some of them scored higher on some of the skills. You know, it's a fun study. It wasn't like yeah, obviously super descriptive, but there, there there's ways in which we have the, the dark triad of, of, mm-hmm. of, of um, narcissism personality. Well, okay. it's, a, you know, yeah, it's an interesting. Oh, go ahead. Do you want me to continue? No, I was going to say, I, I just just kind of on this. There's there's something here about. There's one question I have here, which you bring up in the book, which I really liked how you worded it, which is, it sort of relates. Is kind of you know, so in, in you mentioned it in Beyond Good and Evil, right? Which is uh, Nietzsche's you know big piece, which is how do you accept and embrace certain types of suffering or cruelty of life right mm. it, it's mm. not that's a that's a really hard thing for people to to accept i think it's a very hard thing to accept it's one of those things where it's no the way i describe it when i've talked about this with either students or clients or even in my personal life with friends is for nietzsche suffering and cruelty was not something to avoid so in his mind it wasn't something that you try to jump over you swim under you go around you have to go through it and to not see it as i mean it can on one level it is it sucks and it's terrible but on the other hand we accept it as important and another thing we learn about in life as life just as we would do other things and so it just obviously you know it's we've talked about a lot of themes here but how do you take that aspect of of nietzsche's um uh philosophy and be uh beyond good and evil you know how, how do you unpack that of sorts yeah it's a it's a great question i think it's one of the more powerful yeah uh, pieces in nietzsche's philosophy this um you know it comes out of beyond good and evil you also see it in the um the aphorism in the gay science called the the heaviest weight. Yeah. And in the heaviest weight aphorism, he introduces this notion of the doctrine of eternal recurrence of the same. Mm -hmm. And it's really a doctrine of, are you willing to live this life, this one finite life in the exact same way with all of its boredom and suffering, its cruelty, and also its myriad joys and pleasures over and over and over for all eternity. Yeah. And Nietzsche in this aphorism says that most of us would recoil in horror at this possibility, this thought experiment. Like, God, no, I don't want to live this same life over. I mean, I, I'm looking outside my office and the town is destroyed by a category four hurricane and mm. hundreds of people, well, not scores of people have died and they're without homes. And you know, we just came through COVID and I had a heart attack and yeah. I don't want to live this. I want to live a different life. And yeah. of course, what Nietzsche wants to suggest is that you don't really love your fate then. You don't really practice uh, genuine gratitude for your existence. And 
it's very easy to be grateful for the good things in life, for the, our accomplishments, for the, the fortuitous things that have happened to us, the love of our parents, our friendships, and so on. But what Nietzsche wants to suggest is you also have to be grateful for the shitty things in your life, uh, the cruel boss, the divorce, the, the critical illness. Um, uh, all of those things make you who you are. And so it can't, you can't be selective with gratitude. You can't be acceptive yeah. or, or uh, 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 you know, you can't make exceptions to uh, amor, the love of your life and, and say, well, I love this part, but I hate this part. You have to love it all, all mm. of the, 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 the cruelty and all of the joy, all of the pain and all of the happiness. And it, this is a hard thing to forward especially in cases of extreme hardship. So think yep. about people that have, how are you going to apply that Nietzschean principle uh, to an Auschwitz survivor, a Holocaust survivor, someone that has lived through um, chronic and episodic cruelty and violence Do, from parents? Yeah, you, 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 you give them uh, Nietzsche, and then right afterwards, you give them Viktor Frankl. And you yeah, just... exactly. I was going to say, I, I was gonna say that, that's exactly the argument that I would say that, you know, oftentimes the most life-affirming pieces of philosophy and literature have come out of, of individuals who have gone through tremendous suffering. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. when Viktor Frankl wrote Man's Search for Meaning, he was writing out of the context of Auschwitz and yeah, saying, yeah. even here, even in this apocalyptic hellscape, human beings could carve out moments of generosity and tenderness and make meaning. Yeah. in this place. And you see this in, I think you see this a lot in, in art and music. I mean, think of, of, of Africana blues music in the deep South or, or socially conscious hip hop in impoverished urban neighborhoods mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or, or Appalachian uh, uh, bluegrass in, mm -hmm. in the impoverished hills of Kentucky and, and uh, the Carolinas. I mean, these are ways to create meaning in the face of, of tremendous hardship and despair. And they're, they're, they're uh, uh, experiences of, of embracing life, yeah. embracing what you've been given. And uh, so it's a hard, I, you know, I've lived a pretty, uh, a pretty comfortable life. I've been healthy for the most part. Uh, I have loving parents. I was raised in a stable home. So it's very easy for me to embrace the Nietzschean doctrine and like I think I could live this life over again. Maybe subtract the heart attack and and a couple of messed up uh, relationships. Yeah. Um, but Nietzsche wants to suggest that this can apply to people that live in tremendous hardship. And Nietzsche's own life is a test piece for this. Oh yes. Oh yes. Nietzsche's life was a disaster. I mean, yeah. in almost every form, he was you know, a loser in love. He had chronic health conditions that were haunting him his whole life, forcing him to resign from his, his uh, university position, basically lived in poverty most of his adult mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. and um, wrote all of this life-affirming philosophy, this kind of gay, gay science, this gay philosophy, um, in the face of these, these, um, uh, these crises and hardships. And so I, I always think of Nietzsche as... as this, that's why I brought up Nietzsche at the beginning of that chapter. It's like, look at his life. Yeah. And then, you know, he's writing his autobiography, Etcha Homo, you know, right before he has a complete yeah. mental collapse. Mm -hmm. And no one's reading his books. He's, he's, he's all alone. He's in poverty. His, his mom and sister are sending him sausages wrapped in newspapers so he can survive. He's doped up on morphine and Veranol to sleep. And he's like... I, this is the greatest life ever. My life is so amazing. I would never say, I would never want anything different than the life that I've lived. Yeah. And then a few months later, he goes insane. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's an incredible testament to uh, kind of walking the walk. Yeah, I think of the, another person that comes out to, to my mind is, you know, obviously Abraham Lincoln. And people, yes. I, I don't know if it's true or not. I, I, this, I could be wrong in this, but I read somewhere that there were more books written on Lincoln than on Jesus. I, I, that could be, I could be totally wrong on that. But the point is, is that there's been a shit ton of books written about Abraham. I mean, they still come out. Like, it's, it's insane how people are still writing about this guy. He lived 50 whatever years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> incredible, incredible suffering. 
Mm-hmm. His mom dies. His stepmom dies. His sister, who he was close to, dies. Two sons, or no, the first love of his life, I think, you know, breaks his heart, and then she dies. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, uh, I know one of his kids died. I think it was two. He had four, right? I think he, at least one. The the, the young one. I, don't, I remember if the if he had two that died. But the point, and then obviously he's, you know, president during. The, the only civil war the we've war. still had and it was a whole yeah. thing I mean, your whole presidency is defined by that you know and what you do or don't do and you know and at the end i mean you know he gets shot and dies i mean it's 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 it's, it's but you know one of the things you know about him is people yes, honest ape you know he, he had a really you know good character he um, apparently, you know, told the best jokes and told the best stories and was an incredible orator. And, you know, he's still, I think, you know, the best if, you know, almost everyone puts him as the best or their favorite president. Oh yeah. yeah. And I, and I can't help but think it's because of some of that. I mean, all of that shaped his life and, you know, he was a little bit, you know, I think as, as nobody would, you know, <laughs> take from him that he was a little misanthropic but i think that there's something that he learned how to live and appreciate his life despite all of that you know just constant suffering yeah um i know, think there's another a lot, example. I mean, and he also you know suffered i mean what would easily be called clinical depression um, for sure for right sure right. I think there's something right about that. I mean, this is something that you see in different wisdom traditions. You see it in Christianity and, and Judaism, Buddhism. Yeah. That, that uh, going through suffering, going through hardships, um, of course, they're horrible and they're difficult, but they deepen uh, the reservoirs of compassion and empathy because we can now feel our way into other people who suffer. Certainly. And um, I, I feel this way in my own experience. I mean, after the heart attack, I, I felt, and you see this in the in the book, this sense of being cracked open for the yeah. first time and and this kind of outpouring, because of my vulnerability, because of the suffering and the anxiety I was going through, this kind of tremendous sense of compassion and love for the people that were close to me, and even for complete strangers, recognizing that kind of everyone's going through a life and death struggle, and everyone is 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 uh, trying to make the best of a difficult and painful existence. The problem is, is once I started getting healthy again and going back to the gym and getting on the bike again, that that capacity for compassion started to diminish. Mm. And I started, to, my ego started to get strong again and that sense of self began to assert uh, itself again. And I started to miss that vulnerability, that capacity mm. for compassion. and. Mm. Part of the project of writing that book was a kind of exercise to remind myself of how important it is to, um, to, to see yourself as someone who's vulnerable and dependent and, and open to other people's suffering. Because I could see my ego hardening up again, mm-hmm. and, and, um, uh, and that's the temptation, that's the risk. And Heidegger will re- actually refer to this in this kind of bi- biblical sense of temptation where we're pulled back into the eddy of the they and we lose touch with those reservoirs of deep feeling that the pain or the anxiety opened us up to. Yeah, I think I think it's for whatever reason it, it would be it would be great to make it from a uh state to a trait if you will in terms of suffering in terms mm-hmm. of this kind of outpouring outward. But um it does seem as if you know, suffering is the thing that, that keeps you really anchored to the reality of life more so than anything else. And I'm not too sure why. I mean, I think there might be some ideas, but it's one of those things where it'd be great to, 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 to still keep anchored to the realities of life without the suffering. But, um, it, it's, yeah. it is, it is a, it is an interesting kind of a conundrum, I guess. Well, the, one uh, of the things <clears throat> that comes out of this, Xavier, is that, uh, in recognizing these deep capacities for compassion and fellow feeling for other people that are suffering is that it explodes this myth that we're kind of indoctrinated into in the United States of individualism. Yeah, that, yeah. that the human being is a self-contained, self-reliant individual and the individual needs to pull him or herself up by their bootstraps when things get difficult. 
Mm-hmm. But what suffering reminds us of is that we're not independent beings. We're dependent. We are, we're part of a shared world and we need others to help us mm-hmm. when we're suffering. And this, this hurricane has made this so clear uh, to me as communities have kind of come together and put their own selfishness aside to feed and shelter and clothe each other. Because, you know, as you know, Florida is a tremendously individualistic and selfish and materialistic state. But when the city is blown up by a Cat 4 hurricane, Mm. uh, suddenly we start to recognize our neighbors again and realize, oh, my gosh, I have power. Come over and take a shower. Uh, I'm cooking the steaks that are going bad in my refrigerator on the barbecue. Come over. Mm -hmm. And it's the only time when we go through these hurricanes that we come to know who our neighbors are, who our who, yeah. who the people that yeah. live next door are. Yeah. And um and it's kind of sad once the power goes on and the blue light of the TV you see in every living room again. Yeah. It's like, okay, wait for five more years before I remember who those people are again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. I think it's I think it's it's tough to keep that kind of uh reminder ever present, I think. Mm-hmm. I guess the last question I have for you is uh is you know kind of giving us full circle here which is you know so we all have this inevitability of death it's always there um you know and you know how do we take these ideas from existentialism again not just existentialism of course but you know that's that's the emphasis in in the book and what you've been what you've written on um you know how can we use these to understand our own death and you know our our, our own living how do how do yeah. we how do we best use this well, I'll kind of repeat some of the things that we've talked about already, and I'll, I'll highlight it with a, a, a famous and off-sited study by a palliative care nurse named uh, Bronnie Ware. And I refer to this, I, I gave a talk um, at uh, the Institute on Advanced Aging at the University of Wisconsin a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I had COVID at the time. This was before the, right before the hurricane. Oh, I got geez, COVID. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> But uh, I was starting to think about this famous study of, of Bronnie Ware, and she, as she's talking to people kind of literally on their deathbeds in their last days and weeks, maybe months that they have left, as a nurse, she asks them questions regarding their biggest regrets in life. And the, the normal things come out, like, I wish I wouldn't have worked so hard. I wish I would have spent more time with my friends and family. I wish I would have spent more time doing the things that made me happy. The, kind of the normal recitations mm-hmm, of, mm-hmm. of regret. But the biggest and number one regret that people had on their deathbed was, I wish I would have been true to myself. Mm. I wish I would have led a life that was true to who I was. Mm. And if anything, that is the core idea of existentialism. Don't live the life that others want you to live. Um, life isn't a dress rehearsal. You only get one. And so you have to kind of think deeply and carefully about what it is that you want out of life. Recognize that life can come to an end at any moment and live on the basis of that recognition. Because it's only then that you can, you can start to live authentically. Be true to who you are. And you don't want to be that person on their deathbed saying, God, I wish I would have done this instead of this, lived this life instead of that life. Because that's a powerful and, and, and painful regret that you didn't even live the life that was yours. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it, uh, it, I'll, I'll, I'll end this conversation with, with uh, the main central thing of Heidegger is that, you know, we all have our own Dasein. And it's only our own, right? It's ours. We possess it. No one can have mine or yours or anything like that. And and we have to obviously accept that, but then, you know, take a great amount of care for our own Dasein to try and say, how do I live the life that I have and that I can, then I can, uh, manage. And so, you know, look, I, I think, uh, I think that's that's one of the wonderful things about your, about your book is that you're, you're really, you know, you know, swimming through these concepts in a, in a really nice, tangible way. And so I think it's, uh, I think it's been great. The book is called one beat more existentialism and the gift of mortality. Uh, I'm assuming this is out and about for people to yeah, pick up anywhere. Paperback. Uh, it's everywhere, every bookstore, Amazon. That's and great. I'll say thanks to you. This has been a wonderful conversation, a real pleasure for me. 
And I really think you're doing a real service. Uh, uh, I don't know if people are watching these podcasts worldwide, but um, we need more of this, and I'm glad you're doing it. And you're bringing a level of depth and and intellectual richness to uh, a, a country and a culture that needs it. Well, so it's, really it's, it's, it's very, very, very nice. You're 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 you're, you're too kind. Um, yes, I, I do enjoy this. Uh, I do enjoy doing this. Um, way of of conversing you know I, I, i've talked about it different places but um i used to do uh uh with a group of friends uh salons so this is kind of these ways we would get together once a month and we would have we pick a topic and we would just have at it and uh talk about it uh, at, at an intellectual level but also at an emotional level and and i really enjoyed that and you know right before COVID happened it, it kind of um you know dissolved not because of anything people move away things like that and then obviously the pandemic happened and it was much harder so um you know i i obviously i'm not going to recreate that but i said you know i want to keep having important conversations with really awesome people that are doing good research and good thinking and and about really important things and so um you know i reading your book and obviously having the conversation with you is is a, is a i'm very proud of of the conversation and all the things we touched on and so i can't say enough thanks and um where can people keep people find you online or anywhere else? Find me online. Um, Google me. I have a, a academic page with all of my articles and research. Mm -hmm. You can find the stuff that I've worked on. Um, uh, all of my books are available on Amazon and the new one paperback, 18 bucks. Uh, Polly yeah. does a great job. Uh, the publisher. And, um, I hope that we stay in touch. Yeah, of course. Always. Uh, I, this was really a lot of fun. I, I really, really did enjoy it. And it's always nice to, to, to talk about these issues with someone that's thinking about it and caring about it. So uh, big, big thanks to you for, for, for the conversation. My pleasure. Have All a right. good day. All right. Take care.